So the next slide, please. So uh, these are the members of the committee who generously uh, given their time voluntarily to make this uh, webinar series materialized. So I would like to start myself. Uh, I'm uh, Michael DeCoco. Uh, in my day, uh, my day job is the uh, administrative director at AHMC Seton Medical Center. Uh, as the, the, uh, as uh, I oversee various ancillary services. And I've been with uh, uh, ACHA Cal for almost seven years now. And I am the current chair for the Advancement Committee. Next, Nora. Hi, good morning. I'm Nora Power. Some of you may already know me. I've been on this, this committee for nine years now. Um, I'm the token payer rep in our chapter. I, I work for Aetna. Um, I'm the director of Northern California Network Management. Um, and again, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. And we've had a successful se series of uh, webinars, and we've had several people, several of our attendees pass the exam. And later you'll see where we expect you to send us your picture to put on our wall of fame and to participate on our committee in the, in the future, uh, that way to pay it forward. Thank you. Rick. Morning, I'm, I'm Rick Narrate. I'm Professor of Health Services Administration at uh, California State University, Chico. And uh, I mostly teach uh, health policy, health law, occasionally some other stuff. And a uh, former uh, Cal board member, former treasurer, and I've been on this committee, well, it seems like forever. So really happy to be here. And I'm, I'm really happy with our, our current format of, of doing it online. I think that was one of the good things that COVID, COVID forced us to do. So good luck with everyone. And we have Sashan Gagumpantula. Uh, he won't be with us today, but he'll be with us next week. He's celebrating his birthday. So <laughs> we will uh, ask him to introduce himself next week. And I think Twi. Hi, thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. My name is Twi Do. Um, I actually, this is my, my first uh, year as an official committee member with uh, the Cal team, and it's such an honor to be here. Uh, I am a project and research assistant with a, um, a Bay Area um, organization called Oakland Thrives. So just graduated uh, last <laughs> last May, so I'm, I'm kind of like a rookie in this field, and it's always an honor and a privilege to be here with you all this uh, Saturday morning and to learn with you. Okay, next slide, please. So I'd like to uh, turn over the floor to our partner from San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders. So take it away, Jessica. And thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for the Cal Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. I know that you're on your journey with your fellowship and you might be towards the end of your journey if you are preparing to study for the exam. I first became a fellow in 2018 and passed my exam and I, I recently recertified last year. So I know that the, this is a commitment and I just wanna commend you for all of the work that you're doing, uh, not only in your organizations, but also in your own professional development. Um, I, I am proud to be the, the coach, uh, well, together with you all, and thank you so much to Cal for all the organization and including us uh, on this online program. And so uh, we're, we're really uh, proud to be able to be with uh, another state chapter here and, and join you for the series. And um, it's my honor to introduce uh, James, who was our co-treasurer last year. Oh, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to support you and um, feel very honored and um, looking looking forward to, to provide new support. And um, so um, I think it'd be a great experience for, for everyone. Great, next slide. We also would like to invite you to all of our uh, other um, events. We know that um, we are glad to partner together with uh, California Association of Healthcare Leaders, so with Cal, our Northern California chapter friends, and the Los Angeles chapter friends, and taking advantage of the silver lines of the pandemic where we're able to offer online face-to-face -face education. I know that you are all uh, aiming for your 12 
face-to-face uh, -face credits and your 24 qualified education credits. And so we wanted to offer this as a, another opportunity this year um, with the, the Soul chapter. You're more than welcome to join us on Tuesday uh, for an Innovators Challenge. This is our first Tech and Innovation Committee event and um, really, really excited about this event with this excellent panel of um, both local and national speakers. Also, I also wanted to invite you, um, if you were going to be attending Congress next month, we are having a joint networking session, uh, a joint networking event. Actually, it's going to be a fun event um, on Sunday evening. If, again, if you were in Congress at Congress in Chicago on Sunday evening, and I'll post the link up to our Eventbrite, uh, and that is also in conjunction with Cal. So hope to see you at an event soon, and we're also looking forward to attending Cal events and um, broadening all of our networks. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. And this is for Nora, you're on mute. You know, I was off mute when my phone rang, and I'm sorry I blew everybody's ears out with that. And here I'm talking away, and I'm on mute. So still working on that. OK, so. Um, what we're going to do during this session is, I, to be clear, we're not going to be presenting every piece of information, you know, the knowledge learning that you need to do for prep, preparing for this exam. What we're going to do is um, teach you or in, show you how to read the questions, what the questions are asking, because that's 99% of passing this exam, because you may know everything, but if you're reading through the question incorrectly, um, you, you just may not be able to answer it correctly. So uh, what we'll be covering are the 10 core knowledge areas. And all of this comes straight out of ACHE. You can look it up you know, under the advancement, the fellow section. Um, today we're covering healthcare, which is gonna have 28 questions on the exam, which is gonna be 14% of of the questions. Uh, management and leadership is 26 questions at 13%. Finance is 24 questions, representing 12%. Human resources is 22 questions, representing 11. So it, we put this in de descending order, but again, these are all important. Um, quality and performance management, 20 questions. Business, 18 questions. Healthcare technology and information management, 18 questions. Laws and regs and professionalism and ethics, 16 each. And governance and organizational structure at 12. Doesn't mean that any of these are less important. One of the things you'll be doing as you move forward in this is doing your own competency testing and determine what sections you're better at than others. And you'll be able to focus on those particular areas. Okay, next. Um, for the outline, um, there are 230 questions on the exam, but only 200 are scored. And what they're doing is the other 30 questions, you know, they're testing out to see if, if they work. And every four years, it's a completely new exam because they're replacing questions. Um, so, but you don't know which ones those are. So, um, so again, what they're trying to measure is your competence about the industry in general. There's some book learning, I have to admit, there is some book learning, particularly with finance. And I think there's a couple of other places where you may need to know math formulas in terms of staffing or productivity. But basically they're trying to understand your knowledge base with this exam, um, not just the recall of facts. Although facts and dates like with Laws and regs may, will be important, but we'll get we'll get to that later. Next, um, 
Awesome. Thank you, Nora. Um, so yeah, there was a question in one of the uh, in our, our chat box here. And, and David, I, I love that you're, you're thinking ahead because we do actually have some um, resources and links for you all to uh, to look over and, and review and hopefully the, these will be really helpful tools for your uh, your studying. Um, and, and we will be providing these slides um, for you uh, after after this meeting. So the first one will be a set of webinar um, uh, over like the, the webinars and, and that website. And uh, thank you, Nora, very much for verifying that these are all current. Uh, next would be uh, some other uh, links to prepare, um, such as books and uh, a lot of reference lists, as well as uh, frequently asked questions um, in case you, you have more detailed questions about how the exam is and the processes. Tweet, I, I mean to interrupt just really quickly. I want to point out that um, there are overview webinars that go into detail on how to apply for the fellow and how to advance. And those are very, very useful. And so I put on here that the next se session is coming up next week. And I highly recommend participating in that because what we didn't do, what, what we've done before is go into detail about how to apply, how you qualify. Um, but I highly recommend attending that session. Oh, sorry, thank you. Oh, you're fine, thank you. All right, and so continuing on, um, as, as Nora mentioned of the virtual Board of Governors exam review course, uh, like in conjunction, there's going to be um, this uh, happening, as well as online tutorials for like a self-paced uh, guideline where you can also earn um, education credits. Okay, uh, that's for me. Yeah. So uh, we always give some, uh, you know, uh, some helpful uh, test taking tips for uh, for our uh, attendees. So uh, we always, uh, you know, ask them to, you know, have a hard focus breathing. You know, mostly uh, most of the. Uh, uh, participants who attended before, they always give us a good feedback that it really helps. It's like, you know, uh, breathing through your heart, like inhaling, uh, inhaling for and wait for five seconds and focus and clear all your mind, then exhale and exhale. This process will make you relax during the examination and it will clear your thinking. So it will refocus your thinking. So um, it's really important to, to have that while taking the exam. Um, another uh, 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 tips is read each of the options as true or false. So, you know, if you, you know, always up, uh, you know, uh, get that true or false. Is it true or it is false? Then read, reread, reread, and read and read and understand. It's, it's really important. So uh, you have to, you know, uh, do that. And beware of, you know, questions with all of the above or all except. These are nuisance and they are, you know, they are just trying to, you know, uh, confuse you. So beware of those questions. And, and do, not do not stress out. You have six hours to take the exam. Take breaks. It's really important. So when I took the exam, I took probably uh, two, two breaks when I took the exam because it allowed me to refocus and uh, you know, clear my mind, uh, you know, uh, my mind. So, and um, there's also an option in the, you know, in, in the exam that do not spend too much time on the questions. So if you do not know the answers or you know, the answer to the question, just mark it, mark the, the, mark the question, uh, the, that question, and you can return later on before you submit all your, uh, before you finalize the, uh, your, your answer. So you will be given the chance to review that. So there are there are more test taking uh, you know uh, tips you know uh, from from uh, from the uh, from the uh, Google you can Google it and 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 we will be uh, um, uh, inviting one of our uh, you know one of our uh, test uh, participants who had successfully passed the exam uh, last December for some tips also. So. I'd like to add one other tip here is you know when you're reading and rereading each question, read it backwards. Sometimes that really helps. And the key is the broadest answer, because there may be, every option may be correct, 
but the broadest of them is the one that'll be correct. And you'll see that as we go through our sample questions throughout this series. Thank you. Next slide. So Rick. And this is me. Um, <clears throat> to me. I'm not gonna uh, read all this in depth because some of it you can read right off the website, but this one, I, I think this is the important slide, is how do you prepare? How do you set yourself up for success? And you have to look at what you currently know, what your strengths are, the areas you don't know, and then concentrate on those. So rule of thumb is three to six months. Some people can jump right in, other people take longer, but it's important that you do. You look at yourself within each of the knowledge areas. Now, you don't have to pass each knowledge area independently. There, the test is scored in total. So you're gonna have some areas you're better at, other areas you're weaker at. Don't, don't feel like you have to be perfect in everything. Um, I teach health policy and I teach health law and ethics. So those were just really simple for me. And I didn't have to spend any time really preparing. On the other hand, I spend virtually no time day to day thinking about governance or HR or quality or finance. Um, therefore, when I was preparing for the exam, those were the areas that I, I put my time and effort into. So you have a, a tool that ACHE provides that you can assess your competencies. The link is there. Again, this will this uh, slide will be sent out to everyone. See, so you'll have this, but uh, spend some time on the ACHE website, and you'll see some uh, you'll see some uh, uh, resources that are available to you. Um, once you decide where you want to concentrate, then you can decide what resources you need. And again, ACHE has some, we've got some. Um, and if I can go to the next slide, we'll look at the ACHE study sets. If we can go to the next slide. There we are. Okay, so um, ACHE has this where you can buy it in, in, in mass. I would not jump right into it and buy it until you figured out which ones you need, right? The one resource that I would strongly recommend to everyone, and probably all of us saw this at some point, grad school or whatever, is the, uh, the White Griffith book, The uh, Well-Managed Healthcare Organization. That is probably the single best resource in terms of providing an overview of exam areas. But then if you need additional work in finance, in HR, in info systems, these other books are available as well. And as I said, ACHE sells this as a group. Next slide, please. You can also add on here the, uh, the uh, uh, flashcards. And again, this is something that just different people like to get different ways. So um, if you like working with flashcards, then you might wanna get this. Uh, the good thing is there's also a digital av version available, uh, Quizlet thing, so you might wanna use that, but you know your own learning style better than we know it and you decide what it is that you need. Uh, next slide. That's Nora. Yeah, I need to unmute again. Okay, so um, this is a testimonial from one of our uh, previous participants that just recently passed her exam. So um, basically she just provides uh, basic bullet points that, what this workshop did for her was helped her understand how to how to look at the process and break it down to what worked best for her. Um, and our trademark, the, like the third bullet down about the brain walk that that Rick has perfected is is uh, the secret sauce to to breaking down the questions and answering them. And and again, this what Rick does is he takes each questions or each answer is a true or false. And in this, in this particular case, Jennifer did uh, buy all the materials um, that we showed through the study sets and th that really helped her. But again, you may find that you, there's something else that, that you don't need. Um, what we do in this session, we're providing you everything that we have in our possession in terms of, um, I had sent out in the pre-work slide, uh, Rick's pre-recorded presentation on healthcare. So we're not going to cover the specifics of what he discussed. Instead, we're going to go straight into the questions. Uh, for those of you who just received the pre-work email this morning, there's a link to that recording. 
And then after this session, after each session, we're going to be sending you this particular presentation, um, which includes the sample questions. And we have other older sample questions from ACHE. We don't pretend that they're brand new. Um, they're older, but again, what we're trying to teach is how to look at the questions. Um, ACHE actually provides the information, resources to the information that you can use. And plus there's additional resources out in the wild that ACHE can also offers, um, another list of references. So um, this testimonial is very, very helpful in understanding how she approached it. And several others have, the reason we put this one up here, this is almost the exact same process that other people have, have approached and it worked. And there, here we are, here's our wall of fame. And this will be used soon also. Um, Sachin is, a, he just passed his exam and his isn't on there yet. Um, but so yes, we want your pictures we want your smiling face, and then we want you to pay it forward. Um, give us testimonials. Please answer. We're going to be sending out a, a survey monkey at the end of this, and we take those seriously. And we cannot wait to add you to our wall of fame. OK, so uh, I think we are at the point now that we can start with the, uh, with the question and answer for the healthcare knowledge area. So I'm going to, you know, uh, turn it back to Nora and Rick for the Brainwalk Q&A. So I'm seeing a question come, coming through about if, if that uh, the Advancement Overview webinar is recorded, the one that I was pointing out that ACHE does. It used to be, and I, I do not see anything that shows that it is being recorded because the, the value in that that particular session is the question and answers live. So, um, but what you may want to do is reach out to ACHE and find out if you can get a recording of it, even if, if they don't publish that they do that. Okay. Thank you, Nora, for that. And there's another question about it, the pre-work video referenced a study guide. Um, I, Rick, we can answer that question later. That's within your, your pre-recorded PowerPoint. Okay. We can answer that later. We also have an FAQ slide on each subsequent series that we, we put parking lots, you know, with, for questions, then we answer it in the next session. So we'll be getting back to you. Okay. Okay. Next slide for the question and answer. Okay. So Part of the pre-work um, email that I sent out included the basic focus areas that ACHE recommends to focus on as you're studying for the healthcare section. So, um, and these are straight out of the preparing for your exam portion of the um, advancement section of ACHE.org. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward. I'm not gonna go over those again. We're just trying to, um, spend more time on just looking at how to answer the questions. But if you have any questions, please, please let me know. Okay, so again, what we're gonna do is in these sessions, concentrate on the questions, concentrate on how to interpret the question and, and our tried and true method, Rick's trademark brainwalk to get to the answers. Now, I will admit that even though I've seen some of these questions before, I don't remember the answers. So I, I learn each time I go through this. Okay, so first question, improving profit for provider service network that contracts with employers on a capitated basis, but pays providers on a fee for service basis, improving the profit can be accomplished possibly by A, increasing the number of inpatient procedures, reducing per member per month rates to employers, increasing payment rates to network hospitals or reducing utilization of services. And this, I'm turning it over to Rick to walk through so this. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is, is talk out loud the thought that's going through my head as I try to figure out this question. So I'm reading it first, okay, improving profit. That's a good thing. Okay, we wanna improve profit. 
and they're looking provider provider service network. Is that generic or is that a specific type? I think it's a generic phrase, so I'm going to hold on that that way. And then I see it's it's uh, getting money in on capitated payment, so I have to know what capitation is. But it's paying the providers fee for service. I have to know fee for service. So I've got to have some understanding of how those two are working, and that's going to be what I'm looking at when I look at the the uh, choices. So, okay, A, increasing the number of inpatient procedures. Well, wait a minute, if we're paying fee for service, increasing the number means we're paying more out, that's not gonna improve our, our procedures. So I'm gonna put that down as false. Um, reducing per member per month rates to employers. Well, that's on our revenue side, if we're reducing our revenue, that's not really gonna increase our profits either, not directly. So that one seems false. Um, increasing payment rates to, oh, if we're gonna pay the hospitals more, again, that's that's more money going out, that's a false. So I've got three falses in a row, that fourth one better be true or I'm in trouble. Uh, reducing utilization of services. Well, yeah, if, if we're receiving our money on a capitated basis, we've got the money coming in, that's locked. But if we reduce utilization, that means we're paying fewer fees for service. That should increase our profit. So D is going to be true, and I'm hoping that's the right answer. Yay. <laughs> Are you, I did not look at this beforehand. I really didn't know the answer until I started. OK. Um which of the following is true about a capitated managed care organization arrangement? The provider shifts financial risk to the managed care organization. The provider can bill separately for each service provided. The provider must wait to bill the MCO until services have been provided to a patient or the provider is paid a set fee. Okay, so Again, I got to know what capitation is. And here I've got a concern, managed care organization they've capitalized. And the concern is, are they referring to something specific, a specific type of arrangement? But managed care is still pretty generic. So I'm going to ignore the fact that it's capitalized. Okay. Provider shifts financial risk to the MCO. Uh, no, not, that's not how capitation works. That's false. Provider can bill separately for each service provided. Well, they can, but we're not going to pay them that way on the capitation. Again, difference between capitation fee for service. So that's going to be false. Um, provider must wait to bill until the service has been provided. No, because we're talking about prepayment. Again, I've got to know what capitation is. I know that they get paid per member per month, regardless of services. So that one's false. Again, I'm hoping the D is right because. The only thing left, providers paid a set fee. Yeah, that's the per member per month. That is, that's what capitation is really doing. So I'm gonna put D down as true and I'm gonna hope it's right. Hey, I'm two for two. Okay, a managed care product that permits members of an HMO to obtain care from a non-network, from non-network providers and still have these services partially covered is called a carve out product, point of service product, preferred provider arrangement product, or willing provider product, which should really be any willing provider product. Rick? Okay, so I gotta know what an HMO is. I have to understand the idea of a network to know what non-network providers are. So those are the things I'm trying to recall of what, what are the definitions there. And it's looking like a specific product, a managed care product. Well, I'm not, off the top of my head, if you just asked me what's the name of the product, I probably could not come up with it, right? So what I'm hoping is of the four choices, I'm hoping I can eliminate three of them or at least eliminate two of them and then do a 50-50, which is better than one out of four. So let's see if I can do that. So carve out product. Now carve out is a subcontract where 
the HMO contracts out, but that's not non-network. They're functionally part of the network. So that one's false. Uh, point of service product. Point is, I'm trying to remember the definition. I can't recall the definition. I'm going to put that one on hold. Okay. Preferred provider arrangement. No. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, hmm. Preferred provider. So a PPO means you can you can go out of network, but usually you pay a higher higher copay. So if they're referring to a PPO, that one would be false, or excuse me, be true. Willing provider, or any willing provider will know that's just saying the HMO has to pay anyone who wants to. Um, so yeah, so that one's not. So I'm down to either B or C. And I'm not, I'm honestly not sure. I mean, C sounds right, like it should be right, but I'm not sure what B is totally, because uh, as someone puts in the in the chat room that uh, point of service is a hybrid of the HMO and the PPO. So it does allow people going out of product. So it's one of those two. And at this point, I can honestly just flip a coin between them because I don't know. Um, I've improved my odds from one out of four to one out of two. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip a coin and go with B. Yeah. That was a good coin. So this is, this is a good example of you're right. It could have gone between B and C. Oh, and the key is sometimes a point of service product can include a preferred provider arrangement. So, but B is the more correct and the broader, the broadest answer. So this is what I was talking about when I was mentioning this, that. This is my goal. Uh, also it's also an example of the fact that you don't know everything. I don't know everything. No one going into that test knows everything. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just eliminate the ones that you know are wrong and then flip the coin between the remaining ones and your odds are better than they were. So don't, don't beat yourself up if you don't know the exact answer to everything because you and everyone else. And there's a, there's a comment in the chat room from Robin Talvo. He said, or oh, Robin said, point of service is a hybrid of HMO and PPO, which is correct. Mm -hmm. Which then does make it the broader answer probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I am appreciating everybody's participation in this. Yeah. Um, that's the strength of this program is um, we learn as much from you as you may be learning from us, trust me. Okay. What, what is the type of payment arrangement in which a healthcare organization is willing to accept third-party payment at the highest level of risk? Okay, so we're talking about the healthcare organization that's gonna be the, the uh, provider, the hospital, the doctor, whoever, and they're getting paid from outside, yeah, okay, at the highest level of risk. So we're talking about risk to the provider organization. And I'm gonna go through those four thinking about which one is the highest. I'm picking, I'm kind of ranking my, my, my mind. So a per diem charge, you know, per diem per day. Um, when we tried that with hospitals, we noticed that, uh, that uh, length of stay went up because that was one way we could get additional payments. So that's not totally a high risk, it's partially. It's a prepaid form. Organizations, I, huh? What? Organizations is not a payment arrangement that I'm aware of. We, in test writing, we call that a distractor, but it's not a great one because I can pretty much get rid of it. Uh, capitation, yeah. Now, capitation is almost by definition the highest risk because your, your revenue is 100% capped. You are at risk for all of the utilization. You have to find a way internally to control it. You're not going to get paid more. You get uh, patients who have a lot of services or you can't get your doctors to stop ordering things. So yeah, so far capitation looks like the right one. Uh, case rates, good epidemiology term, not a good payment term. I could pretty much eliminate B and C, B and D rather, because I think they're wrong. And capitation is putting you more at risk than a per diem arrangement. So I'm going to go with C.
Um, correct. So um, one of the things that you'll notice is uh, these questions all involve some sort of capitation arrangement in there or understanding the levels of risk. So it's different ways of asking practically the same question. So you may see a mixture of these, they may be trying to throw you off, but again, you had to know the definition of each of these to be able to understand that. So, and so in case you were thinking, wait, these are the same questions. Yes, but with a twist. And you also may be thinking, wait a minute, isn't that finance, not healthcare? Well, no, because it's how the healthcare system is organized and paid for. So it fits in under healthcare, even though it certainly overlaps with, with finance. Um, the 10 areas are not really distinct. There's definitely a lot of overlap and questions of why is it in one versus the other. The costs of graduate medical education, GME, are of concern to government policymakers because the number of residencies and residents are not centrally controlled. The number of medical school graduates exceeds the number of residency positions. Managed care organizations are relatively uninvolved in the payment of GME. And many residency positions are filled by foreign medical graduates. Okay, so I'm looking at the question again. I gotta know what GME is. At least have a basic idea of what it is and maybe of how it's paid for. And then R of concern tells me that I'm looking for problems or for issues, right? So as I look for those, I'm gonna go through thinking, why is this potentially a problem, particularly a public policy problem? Well, okay, so the number of residencies and residents are not centrally controlled. Well, that certainly could be an issue because it could raise costs. We're, we're getting more hand surgeons than we are family medicine. Maybe that's a problem. That's so okay. A, maybe. Okay. Um, B, number of medical school graduates exceeds the number of residency. I don't know if that's a public policy problem. Um, you know, if it, if it leads to shortage of doctors in some areas, maybe, but that one seems weaker than the first one. Uh, managed care organizations are relatively uninvolved in payment. Well, yeah, Medicare is the big one on payment. So I think that's a big issue. Uh, many residency positions are filled by foreign medical graduates. That's one way we get more doctors here. Probably. Okay, all of these are maybe problems. I'm seeing problems and concerns on all of them. So the question is, which is the most right? You know, which is the real issue? And I would say it's the lack of central control. That just seems to me like the biggest of the ones here, but you can see that all of them are potentially right and you're looking for the one that is the most right. So I'm gonna go with A. And you are most right, you are correct. I am, but I'm not convinced that the others are wrong, which you know is a good indicator of the fact that you can't always assume that there's going to be one right answer. The well, idea of more right is a problem. So the key for me was reading that it was government policymakers, yeah. which got me thinking, okay, we're talking CMS, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is my brain log. And they do cover, you know, cost of GME in their payment formulas. Um, that's, that's where I went down that path and I was and I was thinking, okay, with B, uh, the number of medical school graduates exceeds the number of residency positions. I'm not sure that would impact CMS and their payment formulas. Um, managed care organizations are relatively uninvolved in the payment of GME. Well, I disagree with that because I know that when I do managed care contracting, we, we have to account for stuff like that. I mean, it shifted to private payers as well. And, and Rick, you were right about residency positions being filled by foreign medical graduates. You're right. It's, it improves the supply of docs. So that's, that was my take on this. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Nora, this is Michael. I think uh, 
you made a, a good point in terms of the questions at uh, CMS level. So all the questions are at federal level, so not at state level. So I just want to uh, remind everyone. Yeah, that's a really good reminder, Michael, the fact that you're dealing day to day maybe with California law, but California law is not on the test. It's more of a, a generic national, very good reminder. Yeah, you're right. We do need to emphasize that we're not, especially when you get into HR and stuff, it don't go down the rabbit hole of thinking what happens in California. This is national in scope. This is the same test given to everyone in that, in that particular year. Okay. Which of the following is a unit of measure commonly used to determine physicians' clinical productivity? RVU? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go down this time. Okay. RVU, CMS, IPA, or CPU? So my this daughter's one, like, I can't believe how many acronyms are in this industry. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, I tell my students that they, they're learning a foreign language called TLA, which stands for three letter acronym. Um, this is one where you gotta know it. You gotta know, first of all, what does it stand for? Cause you only have the acronym and then you gotta know what they are. So um, again, if I don't know the answer I might be able to improve my odds by eliminating it. So. RVU, relative value unit. Yes, I do know that's a measure of, of uh, productivity. So I'm, I'm gonna put that down as true for now. I'm gonna hold that. Um, CMS, Center for Medicare Services. No, nope, that's not a unit of uh, productivity. That's our, our uh, umbrella group for Medicare, Medi-Cal, Medicaid. Um, IPA is either a type of beer or it's an independent practice association. I'm guessing they went with the practice association. Again, it's an organization type. It's not a productivity measure. So I'm going to put that false. Um, CPU, I'm thinking of computers. I don't know if there's another definition of it, but it doesn't sound right. If it's computers, it's certainly not right. If it's something else, I don't know what it is. But I do know RVU is a measure. So uh, the other, I'm comfortable leaving the other three and going with RVU. So I'm going to put down A. Yeah, uh, can you go back on that, please? Uh, I just uh, want to, because uh, for me, if I'm answering this question, I would look at the productivity, the word productivity, and productivity refers to an output for me. So in the selections, the only output there is RVU. So I would choose RVU, so. Yeah, that's good. I, I concentrate on unit of measure and you concentrate on productivity and really both of them are things that lead you to, to the correct answer. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you have to practice on when you're doing practice questions is dissecting the questions. Which are the key words that you need to, to concentrate on to get your answer? Which is why I recommend reading it backwards also because then you're picking up on words that by then you're picking up the, the, how the words are linked or how the terms are linked, if that makes sense. Okay. What population demographic factor is currently having the greatest impact on healthcare organizations? Ethnic composition, insurance coverage, geographic distribution or age cohort? Good question. So one of the reasons I don't like this question is the word currently, because maybe it changes from year to year. And I know ACHE is not changing their answers from year to year on the questions. Um, so I'm thinking of, okay, currently is probably not this week. It's probably a broader, a broader time frame. So I'm looking at what's a broader time frame for having the greatest impact. Okay, greatest is the top, it's number one. So I'm looking for something really big. Okay, now again, I think I can make an argument for each one of these as being a, an impact, but what's the greatest impact? So I'm kind of in my mind ranking them. Um, ethnic composition, having an impact on our society in lots of ways, is it having an impact on healthcare organizations? Probably not as much as others. Uh, insurance coverage. Now, if you'd asked that in 2014, 
when the Affordable Care Act was first getting implemented, I would say, wow, yeah, we just went, at least in California, we went way, way up on number of people covered. That's certainly a big impact. If you look at Mississippi, not as much. Uh, geographic distribution of what? Of patients, of doctors, of what? I don't think so. Age cohort. Okay, now, what does that mean? What is age cohort? What's going on in ages? Oh, are people getting older? Yeah, probably. What's that doing to healthcare? Well, we're getting more patients. We're getting more acute patients. We're getting people switching from private insurance to Medicare with that impact. So there I can make a good case that they're having a great impact on healthcare. Is it the greatest? Well, looking again, I'm gonna eliminate geographic because I think that's just a distractor. And I would say that age is probably gonna be more than the other two. Um, insurance, I could probably make a good case for it, but I think age core is probably better. So I'm gonna go with D. You're right. I keep thinking of that book, The Age Wave, and we're in it and our organizations are seeing it. Um, with Aetna, and it, someone mentions it here, um, you know, with Aetna, the Medicare book of business is some of our fastest growing, um, particularly for patients that are retired, members that are retiring out of their employer's insurance into Medicare. And uh, we have a, a, a comment again from Robin that's uh, saying that uh, they're getting sicker and more utilization and demand. Thank you for that, Robin. So Why again, what Rick did was concentrate on greatest. You know, again, be careful of, again, like we said, be, so greatest is the, the biggest scope and be careful of words that say all except or biggest, smallest, least, but this concentrating on that helped eliminate the incorrect answers. Well, it, it less than eliminating as much as ranking, right? Uh, to say, okay, right. yeah, I, the geographic one I could eliminate because that one just makes no sense to me in, the, in, in this context, but the other three, ethnic, insurance, age, all arguably have an impact then I'm going to rank them. I'm going to have to make a judgment about which one is the greatest. Um, do we want to open up and let let the group try to answer some, or do we want to do a couple more? I think I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, someone suggested we take a five minute stretch break, and we could do that as well. We can probably do an uh, open it for questions and an answer. Yeah, so that we have you know uh, insights from the group. So you, yeah, you can uh, unmute yourself and you can uh, speak and let us know what's in your mind. Okay, and then also you can do it in, in the chat as well. Um, we'll give a couple minutes for people to to answer, and then Rick can do his Brayton walk. Okay. Next question. Okay. Oh, okay. Now this is a lot of words. Don't freak out. Remember, read, reread, and then, then look at the answers. Reread the the potential answers. So don't freak out with a lot of words. Public reporting of outcomes information has become a high priority for healthcare payers because. Measurements of performance have now become well-established, standardized, and accepted by all parties. Purchasers are pressuring for disclosure of meaningful performance information for use by buyers and consumers. Consumers in healthcare are now well-organized and managed care organizations feel a need to satisfy them. Physicians are increasingly encouraged their patients to evaluate insurance plans based on publicly reported data. So let's let everyone uh, put their answer in, in the chat box. I can see B, 
B. Yeah, looks like most uh, mo most of them are answering B right now. I think they're all answering B. Yeah. Which I think makes sense. Let's think about it. So measurement of performance has become well-established. No, that's false. We can eliminate that one. Purchases are pressuring. Yeah, we know that, particularly the, you know, the employer groups like LeapFrog and uh, business coalitions are in there. So that one's probably a true. Uh, consumers are well-organized, not a chance. <laughs> Physicians are encouraging their patients to evaluate on data. Not that I've seen, it's more on who's paying. So that one's false. So we can really just go right to B as, as the only one that is obviously true. Yeah, and uh, for me, if uh, the be best uh, you know, tips on this is even though the answer, the answer is really prominent or you know it's there, just go over everything, the, the, uh, the selection, because there might be a best uh, selection there. So just a uh, tip. And thanks for bringing that up, Michael, because I was thinking, OK, everybody answered relatively quickly. So I just want to make sure to, like Michael just said, read, reread, then go through. Because and Heron's point in the chat is really good. The question references high priority for the healthcare payer. So you know, would, would any of the others impact payers directly is something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just asking everyone to make sure that they, if they understand how they answered this question, if they zeroed in on it right away, um, which it's no problem zeroing in on it right away. We're just, um, well, reminding you to be sure and reread and read all the answers. But when there's a lot of words, I know it can get fuzzy. I'm going to go back to uh, something I learned in law school. Uh, our student bar association passed out pencils before an exam that said RTFQ, right, as advice to us. And RTFQ, RTFQ stands for read the friendly question, which I think that's what the F was for. I'm not sure. Um, but it was just a reminder to not immediately zero in on one answer without looking at the others. Mm -hmm. And to make sure you're reading it thoroughly, you're looking at all your options. And a reminder here, don't get stressed on the time. You've got six hours to do this test and it is way more than you will need. So don't feel like you're rushed, you can go through the answers. Health savings accounts, HSA, were established through which law? Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Say that quickly five times backwards. Cover, cover, cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Medicare Pre Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And Americans with Disabilities Act. So put your answer in the, uh, in the chat. I can't tell if the dog is answering or just commenting. <laughs> so I can see some B here. B, yeah. Someone says A or B, leaning towards B. Okay. Why? Uh, may we ask Mike uh, Eichmann, why do you say that? Yeah. I I, I don't know enough about COBRA. I, I think it's more likely that it's part of the modernization stuff because I think HCSA is a relatively recent, but I just did not know the details on the on A. I think C and D were easy to eliminate. So really it's down to a 50-50, but I think I would lean towards B over. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I I would go the same thing as Michael. I said I think you can eliminate C and D pretty quickly if you know what either of those two are. Um, there have been several laws named COBRA. So the one we often think about is the one that extends health insurance, but also just to really throw in some acronyms, MTALO was part of COBRA, okay, the Emergency Medical Treatment Act. Um, so there's a lot of things. When it's an omnibus, it's got a lot of things under there potentially. Uh, Medicare prescription drug, ooh, that kind of forces me to look at prescription drugs. Is HSA is part of that. So I could be very... Uh, torn between A and B as he was. 
and maybe just flip a coin. But if you don't know which of the two, picking between two is better than picking out of four. And survey says, okay, we're ready for the answer. Oh, there. You got it up there. <laughs> B. I have trouble with this one every time. I, I honestly do. I go down a rabbit hole um, and I need to re listen to brain's, Rick's brain walk and participation from, from everyone online. Um, and, and flipping a coin. I'm sorry. And flipping your point. Sometimes you just got to. Um, and so when we get into laws and regs, you know, I mean, it is important to know what's in each one. Can't get around that, sorry. Okay, next. The most useful way for a healthcare organization to deal with outside regulatory and credentialing bodies is to, remember lots of words here, Identify opportunities to influence political outcomes. Regularly maintain both formal and informal relationships with these agencies. Deal with these agencies only in written form so as to have a clear paper trail for subsequent review and analysis. Provide only the minimum amount of information required to comply with the regulations of the agency. Let's see what are the answers there. Ah, most of them are saying B. See some Ds though also. Oh, there's one D, okay. And so again, I want you to be sure and understand how you arrived at that answer. Um, okay, Rick. Well, yeah, so this one's, not a real clean answer, I think, David. So we're looking at the most useful way, most useful. And some of us are probably thinking, well, the most useful is the way I've seen it in the past being useful. Is that generically the most useful? I don't know. Um, identify opportunities to influence political outcomes, uh, something that a lot of health organizations are really effective at doing. Um, does that impact the regulatory agency? Uh, maybe sometimes, okay. We'll put that as a maybe. Regularly maintain formal and informal relationships. Well, I think administrators just, we know that. We know that we do better with people. We have a relationship and um, even if there's a problem in something from a regulatory viewpoint, if we know the people, we probably have a better way of fixing it than if we've maintained a very formal uh relationship only. Okay, so that one's a maybe. Uh, deal with them only in written form. You know, as an attorney, I kind of like that. Make sure that we have a good trail for when we sue people. Um, but, you know, again, that really conflicts with B, you know, for having the informal relationships. And D is setting up a adversary relationship immediately. If you're going to make me you know, pull teeth to get any information out of you as a regulator, um, I'm probably going to start looking more in depth at what you're hiding. So I'm not thinking, I'm thinking that's not the most useful. So of, I can eliminate T, but I'm, I'm liking the other three at least a little bit. I think A is probably the least effective of them, it's useful. So I'm going to get rid of that one. And What's the most useful? Well, probably the most useful is going to be the relationships. Okay. Yes, we should keep track of paper or keep track of things on paper, but having the relationship is probably the one that's going to have the best impact. So I'm going to, I would go with B. So what I'm, what I'm appreciating when I'm seeing in chat is right away people zeroed in on, okay, let's, be careful about only, you know, that, that, that's a key in there. You know, you got to look at it, analyze it and say, is that the best answer? And so what Rick did was look at what is the best and why? And he kept focusing in on the most. most yes. Yeah, exactly. so, I agree. But I'm appreciating how people are, 
how you, the participants are um, approaching this. And this yeah. is a very tough question because there's there's certain, there's a degree of judgment about what's most useful. That's really hard to empirically uh, have a right answer. Yeah, for me because the the C and D are we we usually uh, require that when, whenever there's a survey we you that we do the trail and you know we all, all only provide the minimum amount of information. But the question says so those the, the C and D is useful, but the question says the most useful. So that's why for me I would go with B with that. Right. Again, I like to comment that we, live, we live in a world where B is correct. Um, certainly it's the nicest answer. Mm -hmm. And if you're teaching people how to be administrators of organizations, you're probably going to tell them more likely develop good relationships with the people you're working with, with your stakeholders, more than hold back and don't give them anything. But again, I'm appreciating seeing people's thoughts. Yeah, for sure. The principal advantage for an inpatient facility to affiliate with the geriatric care program is that such an arrangement provides for a continuum of care for patients, permits patients to receive care in home settings, requires less skilled personnel to provide the care, is less costly to the patient. Everyone is saying A. You know, and I'm trying to not emphasize important words that I see in there, but I'm trying to be, but I know I'm giving some of it away. But you should be, as you read them, you should be looking for the important words. Mm -hmm. Keywords. So like we have a full <laughs> consensus on A. Um, and someone points out it's the broadest answer. Mm -hmm. um, it does provide a continuum of care. It, it's a form of uh, vertical integration. Yeah, exactly. Um, permits patients to receive care. Well, if we didn't have this, could they not receive home health care? No, they can receive it. It may not be as coordinated, but it's there. Uh, requires less skilled personnel. No, you know the, the relationship, the affiliation doesn't change the the uh, personnel requirements. Uh, less costly, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean. That depends on what the affiliation is saying, what it's doing. Um, but A is, is a broad answer. It's obviously a, a correct answer. And I would agree that A is right. Um, someone says A or D, and D is the unknown. It might be less costly, but it might not be less costly. So that's why I think I would put A over D. And the keywords for me, there's the continuum of care. Those are the keywords for me. And principal, mm -hmm. principal advantage. Yep. Your board of trustees has voted to terminate the privileges of a physician. Oh, like we've never seen that happen, right? Which of the following organizations must you inform? American Medical Association, local medical society, National Practitioner Data Bank and Joint Commission. So we're seeing B and C here, so. If you know what the National Practitioner Data Bank is and what it does, then that becomes very obviously a, a correct answer. But if you don't, we can still probably eliminate the others. Um, AMA is a private organization lobbying on behalf of physicians, and it has no regulatory power. Um, local Medical Society too, and in fact, call, up, call them up and say, hey, we just got rid of Dr. Jones because he's incompetent and wait for the libel suit to be filed. Um, joint commission, they want to see what your process is, but they're not necessarily looking at individual doctors. And remember, they're not even the only accrediting body. There are other choices for accrediting bodies. 
But National Practitioner Data Bank is the one where you are required to report under certain circumstances, and you are required to check it before granting privileges. So knowing that really leads you to see pretty quickly, even if you didn't know it, though, you could get there. I like that. Let's avoid a doctor death situation. Well, yeah, and uh, you know the doctor who was uh, intentionally killing patients was kicked off the medical staff and then went to other states and got a license and continued to kill patients for a while. And I think there were several states that licensed them before anyone finally did anything. Um, now requiring it to be reported on a national basis and to be checked on a uh, by everyone means that's less likely to happen. We have 33 patients, yeah. Really scary book. Yeah. And uh, uh, just an FYI also, this question cross over with the laws and regulation. Yeah. So just an FYI that they can cross over. Effective facilities maintenance depends on life cycle planning of equipment, an up-to-date inventory of equipment parts for replacement, periodic update of a preventive maintenance schedule, and maintaining facilities on a preventive schedule. Yeah, several comments about, could be all of these. <laughs> I, well, I think they could be all, because I know absolutely nothing about facility maintenance. It's been high on the list of things I know nothing about. So I'm gonna have to work to get to an answer. And yeah, I look at these, they all kind of make sense to me. Rick, so, I think that the key, if I can speak up here, is a, yeah. an actionable versus non-actionable words. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what stood out to me as rolling through them is, uh, again, planning is great, but that planning doesn't mean you do anything with it. So if you're going to be effective, you actually have to act. So life cycle is a plan, right? Up-to-date inventory is a piece of paper. Uh, and a periodic update, again, is just a once in a while check-in. So to be effective, you've got to do it uh, consistently by a schedule. So that's why D stood out to me. I, now that you point that out, it's obvious, but I sure didn't see it until you did. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, but that's really a good way to look at it is which are, which of these words, or which of these choices mean we're actually doing something? I was saying, you know, having updated inventory parts doesn't mean, you know, you're maintaining. It just means you have them. Do you have the right parts? That's the one I was ready to eliminate, but now I see how we can eliminate A and C pretty easily too. And I'm looking on the word depends, which to me sends, says, okay, what's the broadest answer here? But yeah, thank you for, um, for that, Amber. See, this is what I mean. You are our best teachers each and every single time we're on these. So I really appreciate this. Because yeah, out of 50 people in this group, we, we have people who have expertise in all these different areas and not one of us has the expertise in everything. So. That's what makes it really nice. So, so yeah, I'm appreciating everyone's participation. This is great. Okay, so is that the end of this set of sample questions? Yeah, we got the next set. We have a few more, we have 50 minutes. Do we want to take a minute and just ask if anyone has any generic questions or even specific questions about the test, about healthcare? Can I ask a, a question, Rick, real quick? Um, I might have missed it, so I apologize if I did, but are there any actual practice tests out there like this? I mean, this is to me the best practice is just to have a bunch of questions. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I took the I took the uh, BOG exam in 2008, 2000, 2008 um, months after I took the bar exam. Now for the bar exam, which is a real pain, I would not recommend, 
um, there are thousands and thousands literally of practice quests available for people. And therefore, when I got into this, I wondered, where are they? Why aren't there enough? And I never felt like I had enough. And I would say that right now it feels like there's even less. So ACHE does not release old tests easily. Um, if you look in the, uh, the manual that they have for it, they do have some questions, but they don't have an incredible amount. And they used to actually allow, they used to have more. Um, they certainly discourage everyone else from doing it, from you know, coming out of the test and uh, writing down what you took. They don't like you doing that for good reason. Um, so there's st stuff up there, but it tends to be older questions, right? If you're looking at it for um, learning the material, using a test to learn the material, it's less effective. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at it from test taking technique, then the older questions can still be there. So I will say that at the end of the session, at the end of the series, I do send out an old uh, sample test that ACHE no longer supports. Um, they don't vouch for, the answers are correct. They just, they have newer questions now. They don't support it anymore. And I send that out as a caveat to say, this is good for test taking techniques. Don't use it though for trying to get the most up-to-date information that you can get through the study sets. Um, and, and again, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, sorry. So again, we're not trying to teach the material because that's what the sessions at ACHE provides, you know, the Board of Governors exam course and stuff. What we're doing is we're giving you the techniques. We do have some old sample questions from previous tutorials. Um, they're proprietary but, and they're older, but again, it's sample questions just to be able to, you know, learn how to answer the questions, not what the correct answers are. There is a flashcard though that, uh, you know, you can buy if you, I don't know if you uh, have uh, availed that already. It's just a, a series of questions for each uh, body of knowledge that you can, you know, uh, review. Let's hit a couple of the questions that are in the, in the chat. Um, how many questions do you have to get right to pass? The answer is we have no idea. They do right. not tell us, right? So, that is a closely guarded secret in ACHE is what's the passing rate. And I believe that they're using, you know, various statistical things to come up with the exact right thing that may change from year to year, but I don't know, cause they won't tell us. They um, do. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, then uh, is the ACHE, uh, there's an ACHE board exam uh, sample test via Quizlet and that's tied into the, uh, Flash the flashcards that Michael just mentioned. So they're basically the same questions. Um, I will tell you, I don't like them. To be honest, I really don't like them because I think that the wrong answers are too obviously wrong. So I don't think they really give you good practice in differentiating okay. among the choices. They do have some of the content though, which could be a help. And then is the Board of Governors online tutorial worth it for $550? The answer is, it depends. It depends on what you personally need. If you are really strong in everything except finance, then just go do some finance stuff. If on the other hand, you feel like you really do need a, a good review of everything, then I would say, yeah, that, that is worth it. And you do also get some face-to-face -face units as well from it. So- Well, from the online tutorial, you get qualified education credits. Online. Online. And those are worth, uh, just those are worth what you're paying for. If, if you're having trouble getting enough um, qualified education credits. So those are actually the easiest to get though, because even any sessions you intend attend for your job qualify. Um, and that's all in, in the um, ACHE site, what qualifies as face-to-face. -face. The uh, board, of, the online course that's coming on soon, um, that is face-to-face -face credits. Um, but like Rick says, um, I think the value in will be a the credits and b the newer questions and you know the newer material and um, quite honestly, people that have gone through that have found it to be very useful. 
And, and um, going back to the flashcard, uh, mostly the questions in the flashcards are, are, are knowledge based. So, but it's it's a knowledge base. It's like a, a information or terms, uh, you know, uh, retention. But the 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 advantage of me uh, for me when I used that flashcards when I was preparing for the exam was, I know the basic knowledge. I know the basic terms that, in the question, it's all application. So I was able to apply that during the exam because I know the basic terms for those. So it's still helpful for the flashcard. So. So there is, there is a comment about the ACHEBOG exam sample questions via Quizlet for the flashcards. Um, there's a, there's a, a qualifier to that. So it used to be when you had the flashcards, you had access to Quizlet, which is a, a learning tool. Mm -hmm. And you could generate sample questions and true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, and they're great. ACHE no longer supports that. Um, right now, you can get into the flashcards through the ACHE site for learning. The tests that are out in Quizlet now, no problem getting in and seeing them. We can't vouch for the accuracy of the answers. Um, so yes, they're there, but we, we used to use Quizlet in our sessions, but once ACHE starts stops supporting that, um, we, we can't vouch for those. But um, I, yeah, I can't even say that it's worth looking at those because I uh, again we can't vouch for whether they're correct or not any anymore anyway. You have uh, eight minutes. Want to do a few more questions? Yeah. Or you can we can go through uh, the supplemental questions from the flask card. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We save these for if we have time at the end of the sessions. So you want to go through it, uh, or? Yeah, I'll 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 say it. Okay, okay, a management approach that relies heavily on performance measurement, identification of best practices, and formal process specification is evidence-based management, interdisciplinary plan of care, service excellence, point of service approach. And I've never seen this question, so I, okay, Rick, let you do the brain walk. And this oh, is, I, was, I was talking to someone on the chat, I wasn't paying attention, okay. Now I have to read it. So management approach, okay, relies heavily. That's kind of like, you know, important, best, you know, it's looking for something big, not saying in passing. And then I've got some specific things here, performance measure, best practices, formal specifications. Okay, so I'm looking for a, an approach. And my first scan, is there anything here that's not a management approach that I can just get rid of? Uh, interdisciplinary plan of care, that's not really a management approach. So be inclined to get rid of that. Uh, point of service, like we were talking about earlier, is uh, you know it's more uh, of a payment approach, not a management approach necessarily, probably get rid of that. So I'm going to concentrate on A and C here. Uh, Evidence-based management, performance measures, yeah. Best practices, yeah, based on the evidence. That one sounds good. Service excellence is a goal. Do I get service excellence from doing those things? Well, as part of a quality process, it should lead me to excellence but I'm not sure if I like the answer as much as A. So I'm inclined to go to A. Yay, Rick, you got it. I am, I am really on a roll today. I'm just- I know, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that that last comment you had, Rick, that the management approach leads to service excellence, but what approach is it that does that? And that's when you went to, to A. So that made sense to me. And again, a lot of words in this. So you focused on, on the key, key phrases and, and components of that. I mean, a lot of it is just learning how to break down the questions and say, what are they really looking for? What are they asking? 
And again, you know, once we get to some of the others, I mean, it really is, you just have to know what's in those <laughs> rules and regs, or you have to know what the finance comments mean. But in, in that part, we can't teach you. That's, <laughs> that's what you need to be doing. And, that, and there's resources for that, but that's not what this series is trying to accomplish, but we are throwing everything we have at you. Uh, somebody asked how many uh, units do you get for this? It's uh, 7.5 qualified units. Correct. For this program. Um, and those you self-report. We can get that with, on closing comments. Um, medical care provided on an outpatient basis is called urgent care, ambulatory care, emergency care, Medicare. Again, with mass elimination here, urgent care can be provided on an outpatient basis, but it's not the same thing. Right? Outpatient is much broader. Um, ambulatory and outpatient are usually used generic terms, but used the same way. Um, emergency care is not all outpatient is emergency. And Medicare is certainly not outpatient. Um, so, yeah, so people are putting down B, and I would go with that as well. Yes, there it is. Um, so I think we're at a point, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, if Maybe. you don't mind wrapping up the questions and just give a little housekeeping for next session. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Within a few days, you're going to be receiving an email, either from me or from uh, Cal directly, with the materials that we presented today, and a link to our award-winning YouTube video of this session, as well as the PowerPoints to this that we um, shared today. And then you'll be getting another email later with pre-work for next week's session with the uh, Rick's pre-recorded presentations. And um, so my information is on the emails to contact me. And, you know, I also should probably put it in chat in case anybody has any questions for me. And um, so we'll see you same time next week. Nora, can I just make one other real quick thing, which is um, yeah, yeah. as you as you go through the application process, you need to have references from fellows, and feel free to ask any of us for fellows to do that. We're we're more than happy to, and I'm going to also put my my uh, email in the in the chat. Okay. And I can't I can't see today because these glasses don't work anymore. So I think I'm putting in my correct email address. Yeah, looks right. Okay, so we got one minute left. And uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And we hope to see you again next week. Same time, same location on the web. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and again, uh, we really appreciate your participation in this. This is what makes this successful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.